Hello, today is October 16th, 2013. We're meeting today with Mr. William Bud Hargis at his home in Pierce, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Bud, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. You're welcome. Let's start out, if we could, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was born March 1st, uh, 1925 a block and a half from here, here <laughs> in Pierce, and went all through grammar school here, and the, through the eighth grade. My parents, uh, my dad was a barber here in Pierce, and uh, my granddad had a grocery store. Uh, we moved to Arizona in, in 1941 to work on the, my dad to work on the war effort. He was worked on a, uh, air building an air base in Douglas, Arizona, and uh, I, I was drafted in the Army from there. Uh, well, after I went through high school, I went to uh, California and worked in the Kaiser Shipyards as oh, a welder wow. for a little while. And then I, when I turned 18, I went back home and got drafted and it went in the service. Well, now, uh, could you have gotten a deferment for being out on the shipyard? Oh, sure. Yeah. But, I, well, I actually volunteered for the draft. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was uh, sent to... Uh, Fort MacArthur, San Pedro, California, for induction, and then I was sent to up here to Fort Warren for my basic training. Oh, is that right? Uh. <laughs> it was a, kind of a lucky thing. Yeah. So I came down to Pierce every weekend and, and had a good time with friends and family. And uh, from then there, I shipped to San Francisco and uh, went to a Pittsburgh Replacement Depot for a couple of weeks and then we shipped across the street to Camp Stoneman where we were prepared for overseas. I was a, in the Quartermaster Corps from my basic training in Cheyenne. We got to Guadalcanal. <coughs> we, we went from San Francisco to New Mia, New Caledonia. Then well, let, let me back up a, a, a couple questions I want to ask between then and uh, before we move ahead. Um, how was that transition going from civilian life into military life for you? Was it much of a... No, not much. I was an 18-year-old kid and, you know, ready for anything. And it was a little bit hard to take the orders you had to take from some of the corporals they had in uh, Camp Stone, or in uh, Fort MacArthur and then in basic training. They were kind of tough on us, but uh, they kind of preparing you for something that you had ahead of you. Yeah, yeah. And, and roughly what time period was this? Uh, uh, I went in the Army in March, uh, oh, April 1st, 1943. Oh, really? Yeah, and uh, went, then was probably reached basic training by uh, uh, May and uh, spent the summer in Fort Warren uh, and uh, probably got out of basic training in September when he sh shipped us overseas. And I landed in uh, New Maya, New Caledonia on September 27th. And uh, then they shipped us from there to Guadalcanal and then from there to Munda Island. And uh, they asked me what outfit I was in. I told them the Quartermaster Corps. And they said, we don't need Quartermaster here. We need infantry. Here's a rifle and there's front lines that way. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I had never seen an M1 rifle before. Oh. We had old infields and basic training old bolt action and I had never seen an M1. I didn't know how to load it. Oh boy. And, uh, and the old sergeant in the front lines and showed me how to load it. And uh, we, after that campaign, we went into garrison there and first inspection we had, I had no idea how to do ins inspection arms with an M1 and so I fumbled around there and the company commander hollered at the sergeant and said, bring this man a BAR. He don't know how to use it in <laughs> Or the BAR man after that. <laughs> That's a Browning automatic, uh, right? Automatic rifle, yeah. yeah. Well, once again, uh, back, I'm sorry to interrupt your story. Okay. I wanted to back up a little bit, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, that trip from the States down to the, to the South Pacific. I mean, here's a, a landlocked boy from Colorado and Arizona going to sea. Well, that's, that's a story in itself. Yeah. We rode in the World War I troop ship and I think it had the same crew <laughs> and we had uh, baked beans every day and it took 24 days to get 
from San Francisco to New Caledonia. And were, were you able to keep those baked beans down? Or? Oh, yeah. You didn't? I never had sea oh, really? Huh? all in my life, no. Huh. It never bothered me at all. In fact, I, well, if you, yeah, and that's a, it was a very in a, uneventful trip. We sent a few uh, she, uh, flying fish out of the ocean, and the South Pacific Ocean is really something to see. And yeah. It's all usually pretty smooth unless you have a storm, but it was a pretty un uneventful trip. Were you uh, solo or were you in a convoy or? No, we were solo. Really? Yeah. yeah. Any yeah. worries about J Jap subs? Oh, we had no idea of <laughs> such things in that day. <laughs> we hadn't seen them before, but that probably was. I don't, we might have had a tin can with us, I don't know, but I don't remember ever having another ship anywhere in sight. Wow. Yeah, for that trip. Hmm. And then we went from New Caledonia to Guadalcanal and an LST, and then went from that uh, Guadalcanal to Mon Island on an LST, and uh, and that, and uh, I don't know that that campaign was. We we landed on the, the beach there and built a road into Munda Island Airport uh, airfield. The Japanese had an airfield there. And that was the main, our main object was to take that airfield so we could use it. And we took it twice and lost it twice. And we, well, we took it three times. <laughs> and then the CBs were with us and they were in their building right behind us hmm. and sometimes in front of us. <laughs> but uh, they were great guys. Wow. But they built that, one of the biggest airfields in the South Pacific was at Munda Island. They bombed Bougainville. And, all the way up the line from there with the, and all the air support we had was the Corsairs, it was air for, the, for those fighters, and, uh, uh, and then we eventually got dive bombers and then torpedo bombers on the field, and at last then we eventually got the, the, what, the B, what was that? The Flying Fortress, anyway. Yeah, the 17? Yeah, and then the Bockville Boxcar Bombers. Yeah. 24? Yeah, 24s, yeah. It, it, but then the, it was, the battle was all over by then, but they were bombing up north by then. What's it, uh, what's it like to be, I mean, for someone like myself that's never any, been anywhere near a battle, what's it, talk about what it's like being in battle. I mean, what, what's going through your mind? And I mean, I just... Uh, you're you're to... concentrating totally on what is in front of you. If anything moves, you shoot it. And you don't, aim, you shoot from the hip. Uh, there's a story about that too. Uh, but you're constantly afraid, but you're concentrating on staying alive. Wow. And uh, but at that age, you, it doesn't bother you a whole lot. You just go and do it because there's a whole bunch of guys all around you, same age you are, doing the same thing. So, And uh, it doesn't, you don't really think about that too much. And, and the guys that did, they kind of went off the deep end sometimes. But uh, there's, uh, it's it's all tough. But you, you're the age of where you've been trained to take it. Uh, the army's saying was uh, kill or be killed, and that was always in your mind to stay alive to get back home again. So, so do you think that uh, it's an age thing? I mean, I, I look at uh, your conditions. I mean, you were you're out living in a hole out out in the uh, out in the um, elements. In the jungle, uh, yeah. You're, you're you're not sleeping properly. You're not eating properly. Your hygiene's awful. Uh, I mean, any one of those things would knock a man down. But on top of that, you've got the stress of war on top of it. Uh, well, one of the scariest things I saw when I, I went up to the front lines and saw these guys that had been in combat for a while. Their eyes were sunken and buggy, and they hadn't shaved, and they hadn't ate well, and they were a scary-looking bunch out there. Oh, wow! But within a month, I looked just like them. So, and and when the first patrol I went on, you'd think I was an elephant tramping through the jungle, but these guys wanted to shoot me because I made so much noise. But in a month, I could sneak through the jungle and never make a sound, wow. just like the rest of them. So, Wow. It was unbelievable how you adapt. Yeah. 
and how, how was it? I mean, here uh, here's a, a boy that grew up on the prairies of high prairies of Colorado in jungle jungle conditions. Was that uh, it was, it something was, to get used to? Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. The first patrol I went on, uh, uh, one of those vines cut my hat and took it up in the in the jungle. That was the end of my hat. <laughs> you didn't wear helmets on patrol because it made too much noise. So was, yeah, a lot of weird things happened jungle like that. Wow. Uh, and and how, how long were these various battles and campaigns as you guys were working your way up the pipe? Oh, and, and that the, one lasted probably th mm, three months. Three months? Yeah. And off and on, you know, until uh, it was completely over. The worst part was over probably the first three weeks or four weeks. And then uh, and from there we got an R&R &R in New Zealand, which was well, well, really great. Yeah, I'll yeah, bet. Yeah, yeah. How, how long were you guys down in New Zealand then? We were there six weeks, I think. I remember right. It's, it's hard to remember. Yeah, yeah. The people there were so good to us. Even we hated leaving there more than we did home because we didn't know what we were going to when we left home. But we knew what we were going yeah, to. Yeah, right. When we left there for the invasion of New Guinea. Right. Yeah. Well, you... Uh, through the years, did you keep in touch with anybody you'd met down there? I mean, uh, oh, this one girl I went with, I kept in touch with her for a while, but uh, I always thought I'd like to go back to New Zealand, but I never could. So, yeah. and, and this girl wrote to my mother all the rest of the time I was in the service, huh. <clears throat> and I would write to her, and, and so it, it, I, that's all I ever kept track yeah. of. I had a lot of great memories of the countryside. Yeah. And the people were you able to get around it and and sightsee? Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah. We went to to several places, and uh, <clears throat> we were stationed just outside of Auckland, in a near a town called uh, Papatoitoi. It was a Maori name, and uh, and then we went to Hamilton, which is a little ways away because it was not covered with soldiers and sailors and Marines <laughs> like, like Auckland was, <laughs> and we so we had a much better time there yeah hmm. so after resting up in uh new zealand then where did you go from we went to new new guinea they'd already had the invasion there so we just went in and was in part of the battle and then there was uh i can't remember now how many japs were trapped between weewak and and uh atapi river and we had we built uh, barricades there pillboxes, trenches, and we had an automatic weapon in almost every one. And every once in a while they'd try to break through up at Weewak and couldn't make it, and then they'd come down and try to break through ours. And the, the river was just floating with bodies because they, wow. would, they would try to get across that river. We had uh, 105 howitzers zeroed in back aways, and then 80 millimeter mortars, and then 61 millimeter mortars, and then, then the, uh, every, every Bunker had an automatic weapon in it, and the trenches in between had M1 with GIs behind them, and so it was. Uh, they had no chance of getting across mm. the river, and they and we finally left. They were still some of them in that area. That they just left them there to starve until they finally gave up. Some of them would give up every once in a while. Mm. And how long did it take you to get used to the to the BAR? Oh, you? not long. No, yeah. <laughs> First patrol, probably. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, this interesting story we had. We first landed in Munda Island. After we went into garrison, this major from the States built a, a area where we could practice your shooting and, and uh, your combat. Uh, and... Uh, you go through there and a targeted jump up. Sometimes it'd be a Japanese and sometimes it'd be a lady with a baby. And so you had to be on your toes. Well, uh, he got it all finished and we went over to start, try it out. And the first, he said, Sergeant, you go through first and show him how it's done. And well, the first target that came up, he, from the hip, let off eight rounds. That's what an M1 held. And he just chewed him out. He said, no way you could ever hit a target with an M1 from your hip, and you shouldn't shoot eight. Well, they went over and looked. You could put your fist over the eight, 
eight rounds in a target. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what everybody did was shoot from the hip. You didn't have time. Yeah, right. Because there's a guy there in the jungle that you couldn't see because the jungle so thick and uh, you didn't have time to <sighs> aim and fire like you t learned the basic training. Wow. So we learned that I could see why the old Westerners could shoot from the hip and, and pretty accurate. Wow. Wow. So you you uh, went over as a replacement. You weren't yeah. in a unit when you... Yeah, no. And, and, my, my the division was from, New, from uh, New Britain. My company was from New Britain, Connecticut. The division was from the Connecticut National Guard's company, division. And, yeah, we just went over as replacements, yeah. So I, I imagine you didn't have... Uh, I mean, if you went through the quartermasters, you probably didn't have nearly the, the combat training no, that... No, the, no. Yeah. These other guys did, so yeah. it was on the job training for you, oh, pretty much. Yes, huh? definitely. Oh, wow. Yeah, definitely, all the, all the other different way. I had never seen a BAR or a carbine or an M1. And so, yeah, because we had those old infields, we went out. When we went to the target range, we used those. And, but that's the only time you, well, you carried them when you were on guard. When you went on hikes, you carried them. But they were never loaded until yeah. you went on the range. But after overseas, you never were without a loaded weapon. Wow. You had one with you all the time. Hmm. Even in garrison, you kept your weapon loaded with the safety on, of course. And, and what I understand, I mean, once you guys would secure an area, it was never ever really truly secured. You had snipers and the, and the like uh, that you well, always... Yeah, were... guys would sneak in at night and try to try to shoot a couple or three guys. Uh, the Banzai thing, you know, with the Japanese was uh, uh, unbelievable. I just never could understand it when I was in the service. But I read up on some of the history of the Japanese Army after I got out and found out that those guys were snorting coke. When you, we would hear them down below, uh, the old sergeant just yak, 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 and then holler, Banzai. And then he'd go on and on and on. I mean, I, and they were taking a snort of coke every time he'd hire a band's eye. And wow. I can see why they it was all bombed up that they would run right into the kind of fire we had, grenades and and uh, and then usually they would try a attack or two and then they'd pull off back to the next hill and we'd have to go on and take the next hill. But this was mostly in the Philippines when that happened, but it was pretty much once or twice every time you went somewhere. Hmm. And, uh, and they were, and well, all those islands, there was guys hid back in the, that one time in New Guinea, we went on, uh, we heard a, there's a Japanese, bunch of Japanese people coming down the Atapi River, so a whole company of us went up and we chased them clear to the end of the river, but never, they'd, they'd got word that we were coming, so they'd all scattered, but they were, they stayed in those hills for years, I guess. And, uh, they would try to sneak down and, and get out to the ocean where they thought maybe a Japanese submarine might pick them up, but there was none around. Hmm. They were all gone by then. Wow. That battle in Midway pretty well took care of, of uh, the Japanese Navy, and, and, and they weren't able to uh, supply their troops at all hardly after that. The Philippine Islands, they had lots of supplies there. One of the reasons they held out so well there, and and I know there was Japanese in the hills there long after the war was over. Hmm. So, did you have another R and R before you guys moved up to the Philippines? Then no, or? no, we didn't. We just went right from there to the, Phil the invasion of the Philippines. We landed. We were first wave in the Lingayen Gulf in the Philippines. We kind of got lucky there a little bit because. Our division swept out to the left in the, to secure the hills, while the rest of the two divisions went up to the valley there towards Manila and uh, Clark Field and Bo Bogio and places like that. Where, and of course we eventually followed them after we secured it and decided there wasn't anybody coming over the hills there. To, attack from the rear when we followed them up there, got in several battles going up there. And we ended up in a, where they had this prison, you've heard of the prison camp Cabana Tuan. Mm -hmm. That was our base there after the oh, really? war was over, yeah. 
And I just finished the story. I'm sure you've heard of it as uh, Ghost Soldiers. Mm -hmm. It was a battle of Bataan and, and, the, and the stay in, in Cabana Tuan. And uh, that was probably one of the most interesting books I've read about the mm -hmm. war. I, uh, I was right there and knew about all that, but I had no idea of the details and the suffering, the actual suffering that those guys did and the details of their suffering in Cabana Tuan. And but we'd always heard about it being the death march. Everybody heard about yeah, that. Yeah. And uh, and uh, stay in Cabana Tuan for those guys. Thousands of them died there. How would uh, that kind of uh, leads to a question, kind of offshoot question? But I mean, you guys are in these jungle locations, kind of almost isolated. Were you getting news about what was going on in the rest of the world, like the the Battle of Midway and 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 such? I mean, did you know? What, how would you get that kind of information? Well, two or three days later, maybe some officer would get a communicate from headquarters or something, and then he'd tell us about it. When we never knew what a we never knew what an atomic bomb was when they dropped. Yeah, it. what that? Uh, yeah, I had no idea what yeah. that was. And uh, we were in Philippine Islands then training to uh, for the invasion for the of invasion. Japan, and uh, they told us we'd have eighty percent casualties on the beach which it was pretty scary. And so the company commander, we were in very intense training. He'd come out one day and called the company together and told us about it. They had dropped an atomic bomb. We had no idea well, what's an atomic bomb. Yeah. Yeah. So he explained it all to us, and, and it was devastating to think about it, just how much. And so we were all happy the war was going to be over. And well, it, it, two weeks later, it still had, it wasn't over, so they dropped another one. But then it ended right away, and you talk about happy bunch of guys. Yeah, was there a celebration there in oh, camp? Oh my goodness, yes. Yeah. We, uh, well, every day, they had a radio in the mess hall, so they didn't dismiss us early every day, and we'd run up there at noon to listen to the radio to see if it, any uh, news of the war ending, and that was an everyday thing that we looked forward to. But, and then uh, we were all ready to go anyway, so they sent us into Japan as occupation. Occupation, boy, wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, let me ask you, um, I mean, there's always been the controversy whether we should have dropped the bomb or not. Do you want to weigh in on that? Oh, yes. I don't imagine I'd be talking to you right now more than likely if we I, hadn't I don't dropped think it. Harry Truman was ever much of a president, but he, of course, I think then he had to do what he had to do. And uh, I God, that's the scariest thing you could ever imagine, an atomic bomb, and especially the hydrogen bombs they have nowadays. But uh, if we had uh, had to invade Japan, the war would have went on for at least three more years, probably could have been four, and uh, there would have been as many or more Japanese killed in those battles than there would with the atomic bomb, and it saved innumerable American lives. Yeah, yeah. Probably mine. <laughs> yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. Did you ever uh, ever see that uh, then or years later the, the actual invasion plans and where you guys were oh, slated yes. to go oh, in? Oh, yes, yeah. We had saw pictures of the bunkers and, and two American divisions would land <clears throat> in the afternoon on one side of this little island just off the coast of Japan. That was going to be the jumping off spot. And three Russian divisions were to hit them. We were to draw all the attention to us, and then three Russian divisions would hit from the other side and take the island, and then it would have been a base to, for the invasion. Wow. And it was just a sacrifice of, of us guys that were going to go in there. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, you, you talk about these beach landings and such. Uh, kind of going back to one of my earlier questions, what goes through your mind as as you're approaching? I mean, you're you're basically approaching into harm's way. Well, I, I'm just trying to imagine what's going through an 18 year old's mind. Well, I was 19 in the invasion of the Philippines, but we were in uh, amphibious tanks. You were down in, and you could see nothing. You just and these things were bombing towards, and you hear these shells going by, and you think, oh my God, the next one's going to hit us. Well, it turned out they were rockets from the, the other way, which was a great relief, but you were just, man, you were sweating blood sitting down and you couldn't see anything. Couldn't, all you could hear is a thing <laughs> going by. 
and you thought there was Japanese on shore firing at you. But it was a quiet beach. Uh, our first casualty was a, was a young man who uh, was uh, horned by a water buffalo. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he was, of course, the water buffalo had been in that area and he probably had been hit several times with shells because the Navy was sitting out there shelling for days. And they, pro and they were a very cranky animal to start with. <laughs> and he, this guy ran by the bush and this thing came out and threw him in the air. Of course, the poor old bull ended up about a hundred rounds at him. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh. everybody in earshot fired. Hmm. You're, a little, you're a little trigger happy about that time. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and how was it dealing with, uh, I mean, just the violence of it all the, uh, and seeing friends injured and killed? I mean, that's a, no, that's okay. a clock. I thought it was your phone. <laughs> no, that's a, yeah. yeah uh, it, it it was it was apparently probably difficult. I tried to forget all that stuff after yeah. I got oh, okay. home. Uh, yeah, I had some really close friends. Uh, a guy named Red. We were in the hospital together, and we and uh, and he was killed with a sniper fire. And uh, it was really tough because we didn't spend a lot of time together. And but uh, most of my closest friends lived through it. Oh, good. My uh, one of the closest friend, I guess, P. D. Cogburn, he was wounded badly and ended up driving a jeep for a major after that because uh, he went, he had got shrapnel in his shoulder and the left arm was much good after that. So. He didn't get back in combat, which we were always happy about. Somebody getting wounded and getting a uh, ticket home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that uh, that leads to you want to tell your story about the the day you were wounded and and what happened and. Uh, well, it was very pretty uneventful, really. But <laughs> we were pinned down behind this hill, three fifty five, and uh, I had a I was a bazooka man. And by then, oh, really? you know, I got away from the BAR into a bazooka, which wasn't a whole lot better. But, uh, there's two, two or three machine guns on the hill across from us firing, raking those, and everybody went over that hill and didn't come back. And, and so finally the sergeant said, Argus, get that bazooka and get over and get one of those machine gun nests. Well, I thought, I thought oh my God, this is it. And so I reached back to get my machine, my bazooka and a shell went off right behind me and mm. uh, got shrapnel on my right leg. Mm. And so I just thought that it just, you know, hit my whole back and my, and so I thought it just gravel, you know. And so I reached for my bazooka again and, and then I, I, my leg was burning so I reached down there and was rubbing it and that, I just, a natural movement, my hand back was bloody. I said, oh my God, I've been hit. <laughs> so I got to go back <laughs> to the first day day station in and they, then they ended up in the hospital and took a hospital ship back to Hollandia, New Guinea at the 27th General Hospital for oh, about three months, I think. It really, yeah. I got an infection in it. Well, I, about the time it got healed up, I got an infection in it. They had to open it up and there's a piece of brass in there. The Japanese knee mortars had a ring of brass around them because they had they had riflings in their mortars. We had smooth bore mortars, but the, and so they had a piece of brass to work on those riflings, and that's what was causing the infection. So they took that out, and I was fine after that. Hmm. But, hmm. Well, uh, how was it? I mean, uh, did you ever succumb to any of the uh, being in those conditions? The jungle diseases, malaria, or anything like oh, that? Yeah, I had malaria yeah. nine times. Nine times. But mostly after I got out. You took an Adabrin tablet when you was in the Army, and I was a good soldier. I took mine every day. And they said, you'll never have malaria if you take your Adabrin tablet. Well, they didn't tell us you'd take them the rest of your life. <laughs> so I got back home and quit taking them. And I had uh, dengue fever twice. When I was in a, we were on an outpost in New Guinea and no way to get in or out. Well, it was a three-day march through the swamps to get there. And so if you had 105 fever, you couldn't walk out to an aid station. You just had to lay there. Probably the, probably the most miserable thing that could ever happen to a human being. 
uh, they call it the bone crusher disease. It's a, it's carried by mosquitoes, and uh, you feel like your your every bone in your body is in a vice, and somebody's mm. tightening it up. You, your eyeballs hurt, your teeth hurt, your hair hurts, and uh, it takes about two weeks to get over it. And you just know you're going to die, or hoping you can die, and you just know you're going to. <laughs> He was hurt so bad, but uh, that was probably one of the worst parts of my stay in, in New Guinea, anyway. Wow. Did, do we have either one of those, or, or your leg injury flared up? Do they either, no. anything bother you to this day? Uh, change of weather, cold. If you get, if I go out in the cold, or go out in the heat after being in the cold, and it, that I'll get a little twitch down there. That really? metal will expand and contract. Oh, so you still got shrapnel in your... Oh yeah, three pieces are still in there. Yeah, they, they didn't believe in taking them out. They, they, they said they'll never bother you. But so far they were right. So... You probably light up though when you go through the... Uh, at the airport. You yeah. know, it's funny, they never have. Really? Yeah. Uh, they did one time when the guy waved the wand over me, you know, it was the wands, uh -huh. and ran down my leg. And I said, that's shrapnel from World War II. And he said, okay. Took my word for it. <laughs> if I had an honest face, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But that's the only time. Uh -huh. uh, and now, you know, you do like this. Yeah. I don't know how that shows up now. Hmm. So let's move ahead then. So uh, uh, so you were injured, went to the hospital, and then rejoined your unit? Yeah. And, yeah. In, and that was prior to uh, Philippines? No, that was during... In oh, the you, got, you got hit in the Philippines. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then my outfit was up on an outpost. Uh, it was up on this hill, and this friend of mine, Bob, was on the hill across from us, huh. but I didn't know it until after the war. But anyway, we had these guys trapped in there. I don't remember how many thousand Japs were supposed to be in this valley, and we had the river there, and they we had my landmines in the river, and we was up on the hill, and every uh, night if, if those mines went off, we had to count them, and then we, they'd designate three guys to go down them. Reset those. You knew about where they, we knew where they all were, and we could tell about where they went off at. And uh, one time, well, it was my turn, and two other guys, and we went down. We found where the mines had been set off, and so we, they were bouncing Betty's. I don't know if you know what a bouncing Betty is. Oh, please ex ex uh, for people to watch oh, us okay. what that it's is. A, it's a round tube with a shell in it that has a hundred uh, ball bearings. It bounces about six, when it goes off, it bounces about six feet in the air and then explodes. Sends a shower of ball bearings down. And uh, we sat in one, and then there was one the next to it, and we went up where I was kneeled down tying the wire, and we were bo all three were down, three behind this big tree. And the one we had just set went off. And we, holy mackerel. Wow. A ball bearing flying around there, but we were behind the tree, so we were safe. And we looked around, and here was a young Japanese guy with a sack of rice, got hit by it, and he died right away. Huh. <clears throat> he sat there and rocked a little bit, and then fell over. He was dead, blew off the back of his head, and uh, so we had to go set that one again. And then we went back up to the outpost, and the uh, officer said, "Any guys hit, you can get a Purple Heart." Then they had point systems, and Purple Heart was worth five points. Right, right. And so we didn't know, and none of us were hurt at all. So, but that was, and one time it was an interesting. <laughs> so I don't know where they got this dog, but they tied <laughs> ten cans to him and run him down through there and set off a bunch of those. And they followed him so they could get out and get steel rice from the Filipinos. But they didn't get back. We caught them before we got back. But uh, we had to set a bunch of mine the next day. Then. But uh, I don't know what happened to poor old dog. We didn't find him. But, huh. but he was moving fast enough. I guess he got most of the way through there. He set off about a dozen landmines. Wow. Wow. Hmm. How was it uh, uh, communications back home? I mean, in, in today's age, we've got we've got uh, computers and cell phones and the, and the such. Uh, explain what your options were back in the day. Uh, uh, what was it? It was, a, it was a letter you could write. The V-mail? V-mail, that's right. It had an APO number. And when I went overseas, uh, they had, you filled out a card and sent it to your parents. My mom wrote, said, you must be in some kind of secret work. You got a secret number to write to. Uh, 
I couldn't tell her I was going overseas. And, yeah. And but when I left New Zealand, then she she found out that I was overseas. And of course, when I got wounded in the Philippines, she knew where I was at. They sent her a telegram. But yeah, you had everything is not like it is today. Everything was secret. I think they'd have shot a newsman if he'd let out some of that stuff in those days. But uh, everything is secret. So every letter sent home was censored by. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I got mad one time. Went rat, ranting about something. <coughs> My mother wrote. <laughs> I don't know what you were writing about, but it's not readable. <laughs> <laughs> she saved the letter and showed me. It was all blacked out. Uh huh. Uh huh. And and how long would it take uh, mail to travel back oh, and forth? I, Probably a month, depending on where, how far up in the jungle we were and what, where our position was. Sometimes we would get our mail until we got back to garrison a month or so later. Huh. We got paid whenever it was handy. A lot of times I was three months behind I paid. What did you need with money? Yeah, right. No place, no PXs in the jungle. Huh. Yeah. And, and uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but uh, talk a little bit about uh, just your living conditions, you know, where you slept, uh, the food, what you guys... Uh, uh, does we slept on the ground in piles of rocks on, on ammunition and drums, and, and the worst place I ever slept was on a bamboo floor. And, and on a patrol one time, we stayed in a native hut. You can't find any place to lay your bones, it, it's soft. <laughs> Oh, he got so he could sleep anywhere. Hmm. What, uh, I know I woke up one night and water was running in the foxhole, big, big rainstorm. Nothing you could do, you just lay there. You get kind of cold sometimes. One time, filled up the foxholes up to their neck in water, and then it was running out over the top. So uh, That gets a little cold even in the jungle, even in the tropics. Wow. One. <laughs> I go back to Munda Field, I forgot an inter uh, story. We had, uh, we were guarding Munda Field after the battle, and, and there was a, we had hammock, we lived in hammocks, and we had mosquito netting over them. They had a zipper went down one side, and we were sleeping there one night, and the Japanese bombed us. Of course, he went straight up in the air. And, and, that, and that thing turned over, and I was upside down in there, and couldn't find the zipper. And of course, there were still bombs going on. I took my trench knife and cut the top, of it. Oh, <laughs> crawled man. out into my foxhole. That's it's <laughs> you can't imagine how hard it is to find a zipper on the other side of the yeah, right. <laughs> when you're upside down. Yeah, oh, man. Mine just didn't work right when you come out of a dead sleep. Yeah. The bombs landed all over you, yeah, and all around just, you. Well, they were bombing Munda Field, which was right next to where we were stationed. And it was uh, it <laughs> funny afterwards. It wasn't funny very funny at the time. Oh, man. But you had to kind of laugh at things like that. <clears throat> it wasn't much funny stuff going on. Oh, and food was primarily uh, well, field K rations? K rations we started out with which are probably the worst thing you'd ever eat. And then we got sea rations later on. Then at the end, in the, during the uh, Philippines campaign, they had 10 and one rations. There's 10 meals in one box for you and your 10 buddies. And it was all pretty good stuff. Oh, was it? Yeah. yeah, they had pork and beans and, well, bacon. You could lay it on the rock and fry it and stuff <laughs> like that, and cookies and stuff like that. It wasn't too bad to eat. But those old hard sea ration cook crackers were were a little tough. And then hmm. they had lemonade in there, we called it battery acid. It was so strong. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know what they made it out of, but it didn't taste good. Huh. Wow. Would you, would you get back for a, a cooked meal or a warm meal oh, at all? Oh, no. No? No. Once, once, well, when we were on that outpost, they brought us uh, warm meals once a day and we'd go back the, down the hill as would you know volunteer sometimes sometimes the lieutenant say hey you three go down and get the food me and four other guys were went down one time we were laying on the side of the road there waiting for the truck to come and 
heard something behind us. Of course, we all grabbed our rifles and whirled around. There was a Japanese officer waving a white flag, and he'd uh, brought four of his buddies down and surrendered. Wow. And they had they had weapons, but they didn't. They had only maybe a half a dozen rounds of ammunition between them. So when the truck came, while well, we got the food off and put the prisoners on, these cooks, no, 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 we don't even have weapons. What are we going to do? These guys, will, he said, you, they're yours. You take them back to battalion headquarters. And they, we gave them the Japanese weapons to guard them with. Them. But these guys were no problem. They were wanting to surrender. They were tired of living there, no food or anything. So, And every day, planes would fly over and talk to them and drop pamphlets. And this officer did have one of those pamphlets, mm. Resurrect in the pamphlet, so, and they were ready to surrender. This, the fight was all gone out of them. So, but uh, that's and then we we once a day we get warm meals up on top, and of course we'd get a bag of <laughs> uh, some other kind of rations that last the rest of the time. <laughs> wow. Uh, talking with previous uh, interviews like this, a lot of the times the guys would talk about cravings they had. Did you have anything? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. Steak. <laughs> you could think of your girlfriend in a ba bikini and it turned into a steak. <laughs> it just was, we went one time three days without food, and we were on a patrol going up to the Toppy River, <clears throat> and they were dropping our rations behind. Uh, over with C-47 or C DC threes, they were C forty sevens, I guess, and uh, they were dropping our food, but they got dropping them a day behind us, and we we and we were in the village above, and we went three days without food. And, oh, there's no more miserable thing in the world. Yeah, you can't think of anything else but food. Wow. You you start looking at your buddy. <laughs> wow, he looks first. <laughs> It's just unbelievable. Wow. I can see why, like the people in in the, in the mountains there in California, ate some of their people that died mm. because it just it just it just eats you up. Wow. We finally just couldn't go any farther, and they finally got caught up with us and got dropped food. <clears throat> wow. Well, I can't think of anything else right now except. We we went we were four four divisions went to Japan. Yeah, let's go. Let's move on now to uh, to the occupation uh, part of your service. The Eleventh Airborne went in first because mm -hmm. they could fly in, and then the First Cavalry and the Marikal. And I don't know which one went in next, but one of the they were all regular army, and then we went in, and uh, we were only National Guards division there, so we didn't stay about three weeks, I think, maybe a little longer. Anyway. Uh, we uh, built a camp. We were stationed at a abandoned airfield, so we built tents down each side of the runway for it, made a camp out of it, and, we, and then we were relieved. There was a division that went to Europe, and it's, when they landed over there, the war ended, so they loaded them on boats and sent them back through the Panama Canal to Japan. By the time they got over there, the war had ended there, and so they sent them up to J Japan for occupation troops and they, they relieved us and they took us from this little town. Well, we landed there in, in uh, Yokohama and then they took us up to Tokyo past the Imperial Palace. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Stuff like that and yeah. then loaded on uh, the General John Pope came back to the States and so we were well, maybe four weeks. We, get, we didn't do any duty there. We got, we got out one time, a couple of friends of mine and I went out for a little tour. You could you had to have two men armed. You couldn't leave camp. We were in the in the main hangar of this little airport and most of it leaked. <laughs> so we had our bunks all in one corner where we, <laughs> where we didn't and it had a lot of rain in 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 Japan too. It's kinda of like California weather, a lot of fog and a lot of rain. And so we didn't really do any occupation duty there. We just did you have much interaction with the, the, the locals? I mean, no, they, no. We, we weren't allowed to uh, fraternize with anybody, and, and we weren't allowed to spend their money or our money, and so we didn't have any Japanese money. So, yeah, we uh, this friend of mine, that Cogburn, he came, was a jeep driver for major. He came, and picked up two or three of us, and 
and uh, he had a trip ticket and the major had gotten appendicitis and was in the hospital so he took we went to town in fact toured around found out where we could buy some beer and, and uh, just kind of toured around uh, this little town I can't even remember the name of it now but <clears throat> And that, but that's all we spent a couple of days out of the camp and went back. Did you feel safe when you were? I mean, oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah people were friendly as all. Oh, okay, yeah, they, there's no doubt that the war was over for them, and they were seemed to be very happy that it was. And we had a lot of uh, Japanese people came and worked on the base, uh, dug trenches for outhouses, and and did some of the cooking and some of the cleaning and. Uh, they were all very happy to be with us, and we paid them 80 cents an hour, I think, or maybe it was 80 cents a day. I, but they were happy to get it because their economy was in the toilet. There. Right, right. So, was there? Uh, can you describe what you saw as you guys, at various places you went around uh, Japan? Was there quite a bit of damage from the bombings and where were this the town we were at? No, but in Yokohama yeah. when we landed there, there was nothing. You, all you could see was mass of ships sticking out of the water that had been sunk. And there wasn't, <clears throat> I'd say a mile from the shore, there wasn't a thing standing, not a, not a brick. I was really impressed with, we went on the train then out to this airport, airport uh, base, and I was impressed with this old type wheels, it was safe with wheels on it, it been cemented into the ground, into the floor of this plant apparently. And that was the only thing standing, and nothing standing higher than that. Wow! They just set off the, in the off in the ocean with those battleships and, and cruisers, and just on and on and on. And those cruisers had those uh, rockets on them, and they just could fire dozens at a time. Hmm. There just was nothing there, nothing. Wow! wow. Uh, but the Imperial Palace was all standing, and a lot of most of Tokyo wasn't too bad, except around the shoreline, it was all wiped out. But uh, and the air base had been hit, and it was the train stations. There wasn't any train stations. They were just bomb craters that they'd filled in enough to build a track over so they could get the train running again. Wow. They had they had bombed every little train station in the country, I guess, you know, to break down the transportation right. of any kind. So it was it was pretty devastating for those people. Hmm. So I imagine by that point, uh, with the uh, uh, when you were in the occupation, you guys had probably had built up enough points to go home by then. I would think with all the battles and uh, no, not really. It took really uh, seventy. It took seventy points to be eligible. Well, those guys up there with one hundred and fifty, two hundred points, had, had already gotten to go home. And it was funny. I got a picture of the guy too, the sergeant. Justin, he had enough points to go home, so when we went to Japan, they left him in Manila so he could uh, go home because we were going to be there at least two years, we thought at that time. Oh, jeez. And so we got home, and here he was still in Yokohama, or he was still in, in Manila waiting for a boat to come home. <laughs> he wrote to a, a lieutenant that was in my outfit and that I, I knew it was, in fact, we went partying after we got home in, in, uh, Inglewood, California, so uh, he, he got a little bad luck there. <laughs> yeah. hmm. So uh, you guys do your four weeks up Japan and, and you take the ship home. What was that like uh, pulling into to the States? I mean, it was something it's indescribable, really. Uh, a lot of people on the dock there in, in uh, San Francisco to meet the boat. And how was it going under the bridge? I always I hear that's something to. Well, it was, we weren't too impressed. Oh, honest. really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was, of course, I'd been in San Francisco and Oakland before, so I didn't really think too much of it. But it probably was to some Iowa dry land, maybe or something. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> just getting that close to home was, yeah, yeah. was so exciting that nothing else seemed to mind. And then everybody was so nice to you when you got there. And, uh, and we went up the river on the Ernie Pyle uh, barge, or uh, what do they call them, anyway, to Camp Stoneman, and that's where we sh shipped back then to, to uh, Fort MacArthur and San Pedro and discharged. How was it uh, being back really in civilization after being 
was that much of an adjustment? Uh, Not to me. It oh, wasn't. really? Yeah. No, no, I just uh, I had a pocket full of money, and and we had I think three months back pay coming, and then we had three hundred dollars mustering out pay, and of course we only got that a hundred dollars a month for three months, but. Uh, I wanted to buy some civilian clothes. I bought a gray tweed suit, <laughs> <laughs> and my and my sister lived in Long Beach at that oh, time. Oh, okay. And my brother-in-law was a managing a bar there in Long Beach, and so I went down to their place and and stayed for a few days and partied up pretty good until uh, my mother called and said, "Get home." Now, were they still in Arizona, or yeah, by that no, time they, gone? Yeah, they were still in Arizona. Okay. Yeah, they, they didn't, my, well, after they built an air base, my dad got a job as a fireman there, and it stayed open for, I don't know, a year or so after the war, and then they closed the base, and so he, then he came back to Cal, Colorado. Mm -hmm. You talked about your uh, sister there in Long Beach. Is that the one that had the baby? Uh, yeah. You need yeah, to tell that story. Yeah. Uh, she's, she's a, oh. <laughs> forgot that story. She's a year older than I am, and she married fairly young. Uh, we went on the ship to to uh, go overseas. I don't remember the name of the old, but there's no World War II ship. And we got to the harbor in, in uh, New Mea, New Caledonia, about daylight. And they weren't ready for us, so we sat there and they told us, get your bags out and get ready. And we sat there until noon, and then they sent barges out, and then we sat on the dock until 4 o'clock, kept waiting for trucks. And all that day I couldn't think of anything but my sister. And, and I really hadn't thought of her a whole lot, but you do every once in a while, but it just was on my mind that whole day. <laughs> wow. And a few, oh, a month or so later I got a letter from my mother saying that she'd had a baby that day on September 27th. Wow. So it's uh, it's it's a miracle thing. One yeah. of those things you, commit, you right. can't explain. Right, 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 right. Right. Yeah. Hmm. So then from your sisters, then you went to Arizona to your folks? Yeah, yeah. So, and then uh, we, we didn't stay there too much longer. We moved back to Colorado. And I went to barber school and became a barber and worked in all for seven years. And then I, I uh, Got married, and then my wife was graduated from college, and she had a teaching certificate. So we went to California. She got a, a job offer in Chowchilla, California. We went there and spent fifty years. And fifty years? Yeah, she she was a teacher there for thirty three years. Huh. And uh, and then we retired and bought a fifth wheel trailer and run around the country. Then, but our home base was still in in uh, Chowchilla, California. And you went on uh, your professional life as a barber then? Oh, no, until 1975. And the barber business kind of went in the toilet from the hippies. And <laughs> so I bought a Western Auto store, and then I had that for five years. And I went to work for a almond processing plant, the nut almond. Uh -huh. and my wife always said I worked in a nut factory. <laughs> That was kind of it, and then I, that's what I did until I retired at, at 63, and then we just toured around the country in the fifth wheel. Oh, wonderful. And uh, I don't know if I should tell this part of it, but my wife got cancer and passed away in, in 11, and so I've been, well, we came back here because of her cancer, and then when she passed away, I, I was settled here. I'm too old to move now, so yeah, yeah. I'll just stay here. I have kids in California yet, but how, how many years were you guys married all together? Fifty-six. Wow. And how many children? <laughs> Eleven. Eleven children. Well, I I had three from a previous marriage, uh -huh. and then we took in foster children. Um, all of the time she was teaching school. Uh, the oldest one now is 65. And it's, we still talk on the phone every week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any idea, uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, how many you have? I mean, oh, yeah, I have, uh, oh, let's see, eight, I think eight grandchildren. And, uh, ooh, gosh, I don't know. Let's see, four, two, six. Yeah, 
uh, six, uh, ten, at least ten grandchildren, huh. and one great grandchild. One great great. One great, yeah, yeah. one great great grandchild. Wow. Well, how was it? Uh, uh, in my previous question in the beginning, uh, transitioning back from military life and everything that you'd been through overseas back into civilian life. Was that much of a transition for you? Not for me. It was just such no. a relief to be back and sleep in a bed with white sheets and, and uh, uh, associate with people who didn't have any grudge against you or didn't have any orders for you or just everybody was well, was really nice to you. Uh, when I went in that bar in Long Beach, I never bought a drink. Is that right? Yeah. We used to drink beer and bet on the horses. They had a direct line to the bookie, <laughs> but never had to buy a drink. And, uh -huh. and everybody was just really nice to you. Yeah. Uh, well, how was it as far as you talk about sleeping in, in, in bed with sheets? I mean, did you have problems sleeping, nightmares, any flashbacks, or oh, any of the PTSD maybe, that, you know, they... Maybe one time or yeah. two. You were able to put that all behind you yeah. then, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just, you just wake up once in a while with a start and wouldn't have any problem going back to sleep. Some kind of noise, you know, you 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 live by noise. Yeah, yeah. You're in the trench, in the foxhole, and so some kind of noise might wake you once in a while, but you realize right away it's your home and you uh, go back to sleep and mm. don't worry about it. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, not a, I kept in touch with a lot of the guys, none of them ever had any problems. They all seem to be very happy. Uh, one of the guys, Floyd Rainwater, is an Indian boy from Texas. He uh, he died young from uh, liver problems, and I don't know whether he got to drinking when he's got in swimming life or not. I, you know, you don't keep track of that part of right, the guy's right, life. Right, right, <clears throat> The rest of them live fairly old. Did you guys ever have any sort of reunions or anything along that no. line? No. Uh, well, I got together with the, the lieutenant, my uh, my squad leader, uh, in Iowa one or in Nebraska one time. We were on a RV trip going to Wisconsin and went through his part of Nebraska. And I called him, and he came. And one of his daughters came up. And he was a, a buck private when we went in the outfit together, and he never got wounded the whole war. So he he advanced. That's one way you got advanced is not get wounded. <laughs> and he ended up a second lieutenant. Really, when he huh? came home. Huh. And uh, but he was just one of the guys, really. But he was good leader in combat. So. Hmm. So there was no formal like forty third division reunions of any no, sort. No, that, that not that I ever knew of. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, I never was. And we never got the particulars. You were in the forty third division. Do you want to give the rest? Oh, of... okay. Is a hundred. It was. 169th Infantry Regiment and a 3rd Battalion I Company. We were the Milk Battalion, M-I-L-K companies. In it was 103rd and 172nd were the other two regiments, but <coughs> we were in the 100th. And my company was from New Britain, Connecticut. It was New Britain, Connecticut. So how was it? Uh, here, this Midwest Colorado boy dealing with all these East boy, East Coast boys. A lot uh, of Polish boys. Was it? Yeah. A lot of Polish <laughs> yeah. boys. In fact, we had a sergeant that was uh, in the Polish army. He was a tank commander, and when the po Poland fell, he went into Russia, through Germany, through England and came to the United States. There were a lot of Polish people lived in New Britain, Connecticut. And so these guys could get over here being sponsored by okay. some relatives over here. And when he got here, they told him the best way to get citizenship is join the National Guard. Well, they didn't realize they were going to be in the South Pacific <laughs> fighting a war pretty soon. Oh, jeez. But uh, there were several of those guys that came from Poland. Uh, wow. He escaped after the Nazis took over and was in our outfit. Uh, wow. Well, that leads to a question too. Your your dad was in World War One. Did you guys? No, he was. He was. He was too young. Oh, he was too young. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, he was only sixteen when the war ended. Up. Oh, okay. All right. He, he was twenty years older than I am. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you ever your folks ever talk about when you guys when you got back 
I mean, what they were going through, I mean, particularly your mom, I mean... Well, I, I, my dad had turned completely gray-headed from the time I was gone until I got back. Wow. But my mom just, she was one of those people, level all the time. She never, she was really happy to see me get home safe and sound, but she never got really excited about anything or questioned me about anything. Mm. Made life as comfortable for me as she could. Yeah. And, yeah. They did, they did really well, and, and I know my dad and I were always very close, and uh, I know he suffered terribly. Yeah. Oh. But, uh, hmm. So there, uh, I guess I didn't ask you earlier, too, there was just you and your sister? No, I had a younger brother. Younger brother as well? Six years, yeah, he was killed in a car accident oh, wow. when he was 18. Hmm. Well, you mentioned that uh, after you retired, you and your wife did a lot of traveling here in the States. Did you ever get a chance to go back overseas and kind of retrace your steps at all? Or? Uh, I never really had. I always kind of thought maybe I might like to go back to New Zealand, but that's the only place yeah. I'm ever really yeah. interested in. Yeah. Uh, all the rest of the places are just misery. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> but uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand, I really liked, and I would have yeah. liked to have gone back there, but... Never, not not bad enough to get on a ship and go. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Mm. Well, but as we, we start to wind down this interview, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about or any other stories that have kind of floated to the top as we've been talking here that you wanted to, to talk about? So ideally, we have we round out your story as best we can, or do you think we did a pretty good job of it? Oh, well, as far as I can say, uh, I know after you leave, I'll think of Oh, yeah, that's about, always the case, yeah. yeah. But as far as I know, yeah, that's... Uh, it, it, it covered it pretty well. Okay. Well, one question I always like to ask at the end of these interviews is, <clears throat> how do you think that period of time played a role in your life, affected your life, changed your life, or did it? Or was it just simply a chapter in your life that you went through? How would, how would you answer that? I would say a chapter in my life. Really? I yeah. Say, uh, I think I would have probably done the same, the same old thing that I always wanted to enjoy life. Uh, I was kind of a party guy when I was young, but... Uh, Do you think that, that experience enhanced that at all? I mean, did it make you... No, no really? No, huh? I, I was when very bashful when I went into service, and I wasn't when I came out. Really? Huh? Yeah, living with older guys. And yeah. I was the youngest guy in my outfit for a long time. And, uh, yeah, and, and I had realized things that I could do that I hadn't thought about, you know, being a little bit more forward than, than I had been before. Hmm. But uh, I don't know whether it would, my life would have revolved the same way without it or not, but I think it revolved quicker. Yeah. I, I grew up quite a bit. Yeah. And then I wanted to digress into the teenager years again, but Fair enough. <laughs> that didn't <Yeah>. work either. <laughs> uh, hmm. Well, we'll go ahead and wind down this interview. I want to, I want to thank you for sitting down to tell your story today, but... Uh, just as important, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Oh, okay. it's, it's uh, I never think about that. I thought, kind of had forgotten about it. And in the last few years, they, uh, it's gotten brought out a lot more. Yeah. Uh, I think I was most impressed. Bob Alker and Norm Reed, two friends, we played golf together for years, and they were asked. They went on the first honor flight. And they were asked to ride in the parade, that, in the 4th July parade and greeting. So they asked me if I'd take them down. I said, sure. So my wife said, oh, i got to go too. So we took the guys down and we got there. And there wasn't enough guys to ride the parade, so that, uh, Stan asked me to go. And so I went, and I was never so impressed in my life. Is that right? Yeah. About everybody stood yeah. and applauded. Uh, policemen and firemen saluted. Hmm. And the young kids even waved and said thank you. And I, I, was, I was just emotionally mm, wrung yeah. out when I got through. Huh. And so I've gone ever since, but I, I still hadn't gone on that. But they never had enough guys ride that float. And I've, so I've got, since I've gone, I've recruited several alt guys to go next force, if they have a float again, to go on it. That they say, oh, we never thought about it. I said, well, you should. You, it'll be an experience you won't ever forget. Yeah, yeah. And so I hope we can get a whole float load to this next 
Fourth of July can Excellent. stand. We're part on that. <laughs> yeah. well, like yeah. he does everything. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, very good. Well, uh, thank yeah, you, bud. Oh, oh, sure. This is Cogburn was in my outfit, and this is rainwater. And, uh, and of course, this is me. And this is Whitey, another guy. And this was a lieutenant master and Whitey and Cogburn. And uh, they were in our, my outfit. Hmm. Those pictures were taken in New Zealand, I think. Okay. This was me on duty after the Battle of Munda Island. I was on guard duty that day. This is my friend Shorty Harris. We're kind of showing off a little. <laughs> this is Sergeant Justice. He got left in the Philippines okay, when we came okay. home. And this is Cogburn and all these kids from Little Rock, Arkansas. I can't think of his name. Of course, Cogburn was a boxer and he was showing off a little. <laughs> and this was a real close buddy of mine, Richard Gallegos from Pueblo. Oh, wow. He died very young of cancer. Hmm. I think this was Rosen and... and uh, Leon Holder and myself and who else I don't know we were on the on the lake behind the Epo Dam which was the uh, water supply from Manila we were guarding it at the time and here is another guy and myself holding the Japanese flag that we got hmm. and this is a couple of us just got back from patrol oh boy and here uh, uh, this is Leon Holder my friend and this is Leon and I we were just kind of horsing around. He was sitting on my lap when I took that picture. <laughs> and I, I don't, you can't even recognize who that is. <laughs> wow. With my eyes at this day and age. Yeah. And this was, this was a picture of Mester when he was in school. And this is Leon and his girlfriend before he went in the army. Hmm. And this is Hutchin myself and you can't tell. It's such a small picture. Let me go closer on that one. Okay. And this was me after I came out, and my cousin was a photographer, and he took that picture for me. He took the one that's in that, there, too. Mm -hmm. Well, Bud, describe your little shadow box here. Oh. <laughs> uh, this is the time I spent in the service. You got one gold bar for every six months. Of course, this is just an insignia off my hat, and this is off my vest. And this is the, the medals I got. Mm -hmm. It's the combat infantry badge. Yeah, very important. And a purple heart. Purple heart. And I think I think this is a good conduct medal. I lost most of my medals. Uh -huh. And this is a ribbon for a presidential, presidential. citation mm -hmm. that our battalion got. And uh, do the stars uh, mean that uh, battles? Dif dif different battles, yeah. Uh -huh. And this is an invasion, and these are different battles. Okay. Very nice. Yes, we left San Francisco here, went down in, to Numea, New Caledonia, and then we went from there to the Solomon Island. Or, well, here's, yeah, here's Numea, here's the Solomon Islands. We went there, then we went back to New Zealand for R and R, and then we went invasion of the Philippines, or in in New Guinea, mm -hmm. and atop in New Guinea. And then we went from there to Lingay and Gulf here, and invasion of the Philippines. And then from there we went on up to Japan to, to uh, for occupation troops. Yeah, I'm sitting here looking at this map and, and I'm thinking about uh, that time period. I mean, here's a boy that uh, grew up in Colorado and Arizona and you probably traveled a little bit more than most people did. Most people just, yeah. just lived in their, that, yeah, that their hometown pretty, most yeah. of their lives. Now you're halfway across the world in these really exotic locations. It must have been... Uh, very impressive. Yeah, yeah. Very impressive, yeah. yeah. And the ocean, especially, you know, this trip, well, that's a long ways down. Yeah, right. Hmm. Very good.